We've been talking this month about prayer and, and focused on prayer. And really, ever since the, the topic was put before us, uh, my, my mind went to this particular prayer that starts in verse 36 of 26 in Matthew. This is the prayer in Gethsemane. And, and I think about this prayer, and, and especially the insight that we get from the Holy Spirit, as to what in particular was prayed for. And I have questions. Why? Why that prayer? I mean, he was soon to be with the Father, and, and the totality of his mission was going to change post-resurrection. This is the plan that's been in workings since before the foundation of the world. This is what he was born to do, yet he prays, let this cup pass from me. Jesus knowing all things, the scriptures that would speak of this night and would speak to the power of this night were from his very breath. He had breathed those words that Isaiah had said was coming. Yet he says, Remove this cup from me. Why well, pray this prayer? Of all the things that he could have been doing that evening, of all the places he could have been, why there? And really what's interesting about why there is, all he was doing and being in that place was letting the enemy know where he was. Because when the going got tough and things in the mission were difficult, this evidently is where you could find Jesus. Because what does it say of Judas? Judas knew where he would be. He knew he'd be in this garden. This wasn't the first time in a moment like this that Jesus had been in this garden. It wasn't the first time he had prayed. But yet on this evening he prays. And the question I have is why? And I won't be able to answer all the questions, but I have a couple of answers of what was going on that evening. And I hope as we examine this portion of Scriptures, it will strengthen further our prayer life and our walk in Christ. Let's start in verse 36 and let's read what's recorded for us concerning this prayer. Matthew 26 and verse 36, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And He said to His disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. As we examine the, the setting of this prayer and the words of this prayer, let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 1, and let's look at a very familiar portion of scriptures but as we look here we need to understand this is who Jesus is that man that has fallen down on his face and is sorrowful even to the point of death this is him John 1 and verse 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God Meaning He was in the beginning when the plan for salvation for all of mankind was created. He was there when God said, let there be light and there was light. He was there. Verse 3, all things were made through Him and without Him not anything made that was made. In Him was life 
And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That is the Christ who knew all things and knew that this hour was coming. Since the foundation of the world, that evening that He was so sorrowful in was coming. He and the Father planned it this way. Verse 14, speaking of that Word, speaking of that light that John earlier introduced to us, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory as only Son from the Father full of grace and truth. And so, the question is, why did He pray the prayer? And I think, simply, it is that He truly had the weight of the world on His shoulders. And, and we throw that phrase around and nobody ever has the weight of the, show, the world on their shoulders. But He did that night. The sin of all mankind was on His shoulders. The wrath of the Roman government was upon Him. The plot of the Jews was upon Him. Satan's last stand and every effort that he had against God's plan for salvation was upon Him. And He could feel it. And as good of a friend as he had in John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who earlier in that evening laid his head on his chest, as good of a friend as John was, John didn't have a clue what he was going through. John didn't have a clue about the agony that was before Jesus the Christ. John didn't have a clue what it would be like to have Judas Iscariot kiss you on the face and betray you into the hands of sinners with a kiss. John had no idea what it would be like to have your own father leave you on that cross to pay the price and to cover the sin of an unthankful and ungrateful humanity. In this moment in his life, the only person that could realize what he needed and give him the strength he needed in that moment was God. It was truly in this moment that it could be said, God only knows. God only knew the struggle He was going through. God was the only one who could possibly fix anything that was going on in His life. There was no one there who He could have adequately spoken to that could understand what He was going through, yet God alone. And as we also think about this, this was a son speaking to his father. And this go back, goes back to what we talked about last week. In that once we realize the true relationship that we have, we will quit forsaking prayer and we will reach out to our Father over and over again. I am so thankful that God has put a good earthly Father in my life and there have been so many times in my life when I've picked up that phone and just hearing His voice on the other end solved most of the problems that I had before me. And it was in this moment that a son needed to talk to his father. Because it was only a father who could fix the issues that he had in his life. And for those of you who had a good earthly father, they're still limited. They're still flesh. And they're still human. But on this evening, when the weight of the world was on his shoulders, he had to talk to his father. And he was human in what he asked him. I would say this as well. Let's go back in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26 concerning the prayer that he prayed. Matthew 26. Let's look at the end of verse 39. After it says that he fell on his face, he said, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup fat pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. In Matthew's account of this, in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 36, he says, You can do all things. All things are possible through you. Mark adds that for us. Meaning when he went to our Father in prayer that evening, he knew that what he asked could be accomplished. Now it would take moving heaven and earth. It would, it would take some radical change for God to answer the prayer. But what did he say before he prayed the prayer? All things are possible. And let's think about what John 1 says in the beginning. He was there, meaning in the beginning and before His birth 
He was in heaven. And so as he prayed that evening, he knew he was praying to a God who had parted the Red Seas. Who had moved the water so that his people could cross on dry land. Jesus the Christ knew who he was praying to that evening and knew that through him all things were possible. So why not take the burdens of that night to God Almighty? Jesus was there beside the Father when the walls of Jericho came crumbling down by people unworthy and unskilled, just marching and the walls fell. He was there when Gideon's 300 men stood no chance and had no reason for victory, but they were granted victory by God. So therefore, as he prayed, he said, I know that through you all things are possible. He was there when God answered the prayer of Elijah. Time and time again. And Jesus was there as His own virgin birth was thought of and eventually conceived. And therefore, He prayed to His Father that night in faith. And I have to ask myself this simple question this evening. Am I praying to the same God? Am I praying to the same God Jesus prayed to? And the answer, of course, is yes, Devin, you are. It's the same God. No, I mean, do I believe in that God in the manner in which Jesus the Christ believed in that God? And when I pray to Him, do I believe that all things are possible? Or do I believe there's just some things out of His control? Or some things He's not going to spend His time on? But when Jesus the Christ that night prayed, He prayed knowing that all things were possible. May we be encouraged to approach the Father in the same manner, knowing that no one else can answer the issues in our lives. And no one else can accomplish what we are asking Him to do. Because our God can accomplish greatness. Now as we continue to think about this, we understand that He was praying in God's will. And He was praying for God's will to be accomplished. We're going to close our thoughts tonight concerning that. But, but I want us to realize that at times it, it, it's, it's still okay to pray for what we want and pray for what's ahead of us. Even though we understand God's will, we can pray to God. Genesis chapter 18. There are times when God's will is, is a struggle for us. And, and wrapping our minds around what's going on in God's will is tough. Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Jesus clearly, as He prays this evening, He knows the will of God. He knows what has to happen. But He still prays to the Father. Verse 20 of Genesis chapter 18. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Verse 22, so the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? What's Abraham concerned about? We're going to find in this dialogue that he has, in this conversation that he has with God, he's concerned about two things. One, he's concerned about family. We know that Lot is there. and He's greatly concerned about family. But he's also concerned about the righteousness of God. And I know what you're going to say, Devin. This is a conversation. This isn't prayer. Again, that goes back to what we talked about last week. That's what prayer is. It's a conversation with God that for whatever reason, He has granted unto us the opportunity to speak to Him. And Abraham's speaking to him and says, Lord, will you not just preserve the righteous, please? Verse 25, far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Verse 26, and the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. I, I, I will slow down. For their sake and your request. And in here in verse 27, what we find is how we approach God in prayer and how we can be more confident in our prayer life is if we approach Him appropriately. 
and in the manner in which we should call upon him. We see Abraham's confidence in speaking of God increase because he recognizes who he is when he makes his request to God Almighty. Verse 27, Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Are we doing that when we call upon God in prayer? Are we just taking advantage of the opportunity we have? Do we feel as though when we approach God in prayer that He owes us something? Or do we call upon Him as mere ashes and dust? And recognizing that within ourselves nothing can be accomplished, but with God all things can be accomplished. And see, this is Abraham who realizes the inabilities of himself, and therefore he calls upon the righteousness and the justice of God in this moment to save his family. Verse 28, suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. And this conversation goes on and on and on. And, and, and we realize the struggle. Verse 32, then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak again, but this once. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went His way when He had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Chapter 19 and verse 1, Then two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting there in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Lot is saved through the long suffering of God. The righteous indeed are saved, and not all in that city perish, but the righteous are rescued. And in part, because of a conversation that, that Abraham has with God. Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Moses it, it finds himself in a similar predicament, struggling with, with the will of God and struggling with what's going on. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 11. God is, is, is tired. These people have worn Him out. They've been complaining ever since they crossed that great Red Sea that, that He had parted. And God's done with them. Verse 11 of Numbers chapter 14. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise Me? And how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs I've done among them, I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a great, greater and mightier than they. Make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. He's done with these people. And can you blame him? They, they've had every opportunity to believe in God Almighty. And he says, I'm done with this group of people. I will rise up a new nation that will glorify me. Verse 13, but Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear of it. For you brought up this people in your might from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of the land they have heard of you, O Lord, are in the midst of the people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face, and your clouds stand over them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Verse 15, Now if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard your fame will say it is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that He swore to give to them. And He has killed them in the wilderness. Again, Moses is worried about what? A similar thing that Abraham was worried about. The righteousness of God. The reputation of God. You kindle that or you pair that with a humble spirit and you can call upon God for anything. If you're truly concerned about His righteousness and His kingdom and the expanse of His kingdom and you call upon Him humbly, you have every reason to expect an answer from God. As we continue on and we have this conversation that again Moses is having with God the Father, Continuing here in verse 17, And now please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgressions, but He will by no means clear the guilty. So we're not going to let the guilty walk, but please don't destroy them. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children 
to the third and fourth generation, please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Verse 20, then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Why? Why did he listen to Moses? I don't know the full answer. But I know that God wants to hear from us. And God is in the business of pardoning and reconciling of people. And that's exactly what Moses asked for was a pardon and reconciliation. And he asked of this for a nation. And as a story in the history of God continues, we now have the ability to ask for our own pardon and ask to be right with God before Him through prayer. If we too will humble ourselves before the Lord as Abraham, do, as Abraham did, but also call upon Him with confidence that He is a God of steadfast love and He answers prayers. And so Moses in that moment asked for the pardoning of a nation so too today we can call upon Him for the pardoning of ourselves once we've rendered obedience to His Gospel and found ourselves in right relationship with Him. We can know that we continue to walk in His steadfast love. We also understand that <clears throat> heaven and earth, meaning the physical heaven and earth, were, were moved in a mighty way in 1 Kings 17 when Elijah asked that there be not rain. And God had already made the promise now. Now, there's seed time and harvest. And then there's things that are going to work. And Elijah said, hey, but don't let the rain work. For three years. Not for a day, not for a season, but for three years he asked of that. And why? Why did he ask for that? It was really for the glory of God. So what Jesus knew on that evening of prayer was all things are possible. And that God was willing to bend toward the cry of godly men. And so he prayed that evening, may this cup pass from me. Let's turn back in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> Two more observations here. Verse 40. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see on this night, when the weight of the world was on his shoulders, and he needed time with his father, who else was he concerned about? Peter. And the other disciples. And I think that's probably another hindrance from, from our prayers. We're at times too selfish. Even in this moment, and in this evening, that Jesus had every opportunity and every right to be selfish. He's thinking of others. He's praying for others. He had already told Peter that he was praying for him, that he would not enter temptation. And, and we can presume that as he commends Peter to also pray that he would not enter temptation. In that moment, Jesus Himself prayed to God that Peter would be relieved from the temptation that was before him. And so even in this moment of agony, when the sweat became blood, he was still thinking of others. Two questions for us. Are we that way in our lives? Do we make time for others in our lives? Or do we sometimes get so caught up in ourselves that it's all about us? And we can't serve others. Why? Because it's an inconvenience to us. It's an hour down the road to do that. Or it's too hot. Or it's this and it's that. Serve others. Quit making it about yourself. There's all kinds of excuses that our Lord could have made that night. But He knew Peter was hurting. And He knew Peter needed Him. And He was there for him. And brethren, we need to answer the same call. And we need to be the same people. Quit making excuses and be there for your brothers and sisters. And the second thing we need to realize in this moment is you need to pray for them. And you need to pray for them. And you need to be quit making your time with God. That precious time with God that you've been granted. Quit making it all about yourself. And then you'll be strengthened. 
It's interesting that when you truly care for others, how much stronger you become. And when you truly serve others, how much you can learn and how much better you can be. And our Savior did that that night. But now here's the last part and last observation. Everything He prays for, He prays that your will be done. And we know the rest of the story. The prophesied plan for that night unfolded just as it had been prophesied. The betrayal was still there. The heartache was still there. The beatings were still there. The disrespect was still there. The spit in his face, the crown of thorns, the blood, the agony was still there. And he prayed, Thy will be done. I've heard prayers. I'm not saying everybody does this, but I've heard prayers that Thy will be done is kind of a band-aid to mean this. I don't really think you can do this, so I'm going to add on Thy will be done. That's what we do. May they be healed of cancer, but only in Thy will. What are we thinking when we say that? Let's analyze what the Lord meant when He said Thy will be done. What He said when He said Thy will be done was, I will be faithful no matter what your will is, and no matter what plan you have for me in my life, Thy will be done. And I will walk in Your will, and I will serve You in Your will, and I will be content in Your will. Too often we don't pray with enough confidence that we can act and we can serve within the confines of His will. And we're afraid to pray. And truly pray. Because when Jesus said, Thy will be done, it cost Him everything. But what he knew was he was still right with God. And better than that is he knew we were right with God because he was walking in the will of God. And so therefore he prayed, Thy will be done. And he was ready to walk the walk that the Lord had before him. And may we, when we say Thy will be done, may we know that in His will, in the confines of His will, our God will never leave us nor forsake us, but He will be there with us, assuring us that we have the strength to continue in His will, in His pathway. Thy will be done. Too often we're looking for a way to work around His will or not work with Him. Instead of truly praying, Thy will be done, and Lord God, I know You will give me the strength to operate within Your will. May we be willing this evening to accept all things in His will and know that in His will and in His plan, all things work together for good for those who serve the Lord. And it was through walking in God's will that evening that yes, He suffered and He suffered mightily. But Philippians chapter 2 would tell us that after that suffering, what happened? He was glorified and He was exalted. And brethren, that's the pathway for us. And we need to pray for strength that we can work within the confines of His will. And though it may cost us and though it may be suffering, in the end it will be glory. If not in this life, but the next. So in all things, may His will be done. And may we have the strength to operate within that. What a wonderful thought to think in such agony in that evening. Our Savior had somebody to talk to. He had a father to talk to. When he taught his disciples to pray, the first thing he said was, call upon your father. That one you have a relationship with. If you've not yet rendered obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you cannot call him your father. And this is beautiful, and this was comforting for Jesus that evening just to speak with God. You can have that same comfort and confidence if you'll just obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and be buried with Him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. But if there's something else hindering your prayer life, some sin in your life that you think has been in a public way or you just think you need the prayers of the saints here, we are here for you and will help you in any way. If your walk needs to be better this evening and we can help you, please come forward as together we stand and as we sing.